those who are staying up here can turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, again this morning as we continue our new series in that wonderful book where we get to look at how great our God is. We get to continue doing that as we continue this hymn of praise here. That's what it's written like, uh, beginning in verses uh, 3 through 14 here, uh, to start out this book. And of course, singing how great our God is, is, is what we're made to do. Uh, we are all worshipers. Uh, we will all worship someone or something because that's how God made us. Uh, he made us to worship him, of course, uh, to honor him, to glorify his holy name. But in our sin, we trade our worship for God, for worship of something else, some cheap imitation, usually weak imitations. And in doing that, we end up really wasting our lives settling for second best. And the problem, though, is in our sin, we really can't do any better. And so we need help. We need God to fix what is broken. We need God to ultimately bring us to himself so that we can see how great our God is, and, and that's what Ephesians is doing for us, and that's what we've seen, or started to see as we, as we began looking at verses 3 through 6 last week, um, and we see how great our God is. We see that God has given us everything we need in Jesus Christ to be who he made us to be. In Christ, we can ultimately live the life that we were created to live. And as we begin looking at this book, we, we see how God has richly blessed us in Christ so that we can live for God's glory. And one of the things that I hope jumps off the page for you as you read through verses 3 through 14 is the way in which God gives to us. He's gracious in his giving. He goes overboard in the way that he blesses us. How great is our God? As one writer says, God is not a reluctant giver of these spiritual blessings. He's delighted to give them. He's under no compulsion to give them either. He's not forced. He's not, uh, you know, he's not strong-armed into doing it. He didn't have to do it for us. We were rebels. We were sinners. We violated all of his laws, all of his commands. He didn't owe us anything except really justice. But God gives us grace. He lavishes his gifts of grace upon us. Instead of pouring out his wrath on us, he pours that out on Christ so that he can pour out blessings and riches and treasures upon us. How great is our God. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he for your sakes became poor, that through his poverty we might be rich. And that's what we're seeing as we begin this amazing book is that God chooses to lavishly pour out his blessings and his favor on us in Jesus Christ so that we can ultimately live for God's glory. And so because God has richly blessed us in Christ Jesus, we are to live for God's glory. And that's still the big idea that we see here in this text. And we're going to begin our, our passage here in verse 3 of Ephesians chapter 1. And I'll read down through verse 10. Uh, today, because that's as, as far as we will get. And I was going to take my watch off because I'm not going to look at the time. No, because the, the clock is not correct. That says 6.30, so that's either where we got a lot of time or not. But I'd like you to be able to get out of here sometime before 1.30, so we're going to put the, the watch down there. Uh, beginning uh, in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How great is our God, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for uh, the love, the grace, the mercy 
uh, the riches that you have freely given to us in Christ. And we pray, Father, that as we continue to look uh, into this incredible uh, passage of Scripture, we pray that you would open our eyes to see how awesome you are, that we might adore you, that we might be in awe of you, that we might ultimately be moved and compelled to live our lives for your glory, that we would see how great uh, you are as we go through this passage today. And I, and I pray that uh, as I speak that, that I would not distract from uh, your glory and your greatness, and that you would just help me to do justice uh, to what is here. Pray for the ability and wisdom that I do not have, uh, that it would come from you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, we began looking in this incredible uh, passage of Scripture, and we saw three treasures that God has graciously given to us, and because of those three treasures and more, uh, we are richly blessed. Last week, we saw that by God's grace, we are chosen by God, we are children of God, and by His grace, we are also cherished by God. And really, those three treasures change everything for us. Um, they should move us to that awe and adoration uh, of God because of who He is and what he has given to us. And so today, as we continue to look at this passage of praise, uh, we are again reminded of who we are in Christ and what incredible blessings we have in Christ. Again, because God has richly and graciously blessed us in Jesus Christ, we are to live for his glory, right? This, is, this, this idea of everything that God has given to us is to bring about a change in us so that we can be who we're meant to be. We can worship who we were meant to worship. And so today we want to look at three more treasures that God has given to us. And as we consider those treasures, we want to consider how they change our lives, how we should respond for his glory to those treasures. And the first treasure that we see is that in Christ... You are purchased by God. In Christ, we are purchased by God, which is an incredible thing. We are bought. Uh, we are brought out of slavery by God. In verse 7, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And so that's the treasure that we see here in verse 7. Redemption means to, to set free. It means to release from a, a captive position. And the word uh, would be used of, of the freeing of slaves or the, the freeing of prisoners even. Um, and that idea of redemption you see throughout Old Testament history. Uh, you have the idea of the, the kinsman redeemer uh, back in the Old Testament as well. If a man became so poor that he had fallen into to, to debt, he, he would often be a, a slave because of that. And then a near relative could come in and pay his debts in order to set him free. So you have that idea of redemption there as well. Uh, you see the word uh, used of uh, the Israelites in slavery in, in Egypt, right? And, and God redeems them out of slavery. He says, I'll redeem you with an outstretched arm, with mighty acts of judgment. So there's this idea of being captive, uh, of being trapped, uh, of being uh, chained, and then the idea of redemption is being set free. Uh, and, and that's what redemption is all about. Because you and me, apart from Jesus Christ, we are trapped. We're slaves. We are chained uh, to sin. And that's the condition of every human being outside of Jesus Christ. Because nobody, as much as we might like, think, like to think we are born free, nobody is born free, as free as the wind blows, or however the song goes. Uh, we don't come into this world free. We are slaves. We're not slaves of righteousness when we come into this world either. We're not seeking to, to follow God in his ways. No, quite the opposite, really. We are born in sin and we are held captive by it. And that's how the Bible describes uh, sin. In Romans 6.20, it says, when you were uh, slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Right? You were not committing righteousness by accident when you were a slave to sin. Sin was your master. John, Jesus says in John 8, 34, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. So we're not born free. Without, you know, some people think, you know, without God, then I can live my life in freedom, in freedom the way that I want to. Well, no, you're not, because you're going to follow sin instead. You're a slave to sin. Unfortunately, when we're slaves to sin, we faithfully follow our master, sin. Right? And so then, as we follow that cruel taskmaster, there's a hostility and there's a hatred toward God, toward our true master, toward our true creator. Like I said, uh, we were created to worship God, but 
because we're sinners, we don't. We end up worshiping something else, something lesser. And so we're comfortable in our sin. And ultimately, that makes us leery of anybody who tries to pull us out of that sin, to rescue us from it, because we think, I don't need to be rescued. We don't even realize we're trapped. We don't realize we're in a prison, that we're in a cage or a slave yard, because that's all we knew. We're held captive to the clutches of sin, and we have no way out. And, and we didn't want anybody to rescue, right? You remember, remember when Jesus uh, came to the earth and, and people hated him because, why? They loved darkness rather than light. And so rather than get out of the darkness, they said, let's get rid of the light, and they nailed him to the cross. That's what sin does. I like how one writer put it. He says, sin is a slave driver that first tempts us and then brutally punishes us. And that's why you and I need redemption. That's why every human soul, every human being needs redemption. Because we are chained by sin. We are held captive to it. We have no hope of freedom. It's our master. Titus 3.3 3 says, we are so, we, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, pa passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. That's the life apart from Jesus Christ. Stuck in a prison of our own sin. Trapped. Driven by our sinful passions. Driven by our sinful desires. Anything but free. We needed freedom. We needed redemption. But we had no way to free ourselves. We couldn't be our own redeemers. We needed somebody else. And not only is sin a ruthless taskmaster that promises what it cannot deliver, sin will also ultimately kill you. It will destroy you. And God warned the very first people that he ever created of that very fact. He said to Adam in the garden, if you eat of that forbidden fruit, you're going to die. You will die. There's a guarantee there. Sin will kill you. Rebellion against your infinitely perfect, loving, holy, righteous, wise, and good God will be punished. God was upfront about that from the get-go. Sin incurs and it requires a penalty. Not just any penalty, the steepest of penalties. Romans 6 says the wages of sin is death. It's the same thing that God said in the beginning. Ezekiel also says the soul that sins, it will die. And sometimes people bristle at that idea that, well, that seems pretty harsh, that, that, that sin would cause uh, physical and spiritual death, eternity separated from God sounds awful. Why, why for my sin? Well, that's because as sinners, we live in sin. We minimize its seriousness until somebody wrongs us, right? Somebody wrongs me, then it's a serious problem. But if they wrong God, eh, no big deal because we've put ourselves in the place of God. But God is a holy God. He is a good God, a loving God, a gracious and kind God who, who made us. He's our maker. And he's patient with us. And he sees sin for what it really is. It's rebellion against him, right? That's what every sin is. It's high treason against our rightful ruler. God, yes, he made us, so he has authority over us. And so anytime we sin... It's an attempt by creation to strong arm the creator out of his throne. Or we're going to WWE him off the throne. That's what sin is. I'm going to take him, I'm going to suplex him, and I'm going to take over. That's what sin is. Whether it's murmuring, whether it's grumbling, whether it's complaining, whether it's fear, whether it's anxiety, whatever that sin is, you're saying to God, no, you're doing it wrong. And if I were God, I'd be doing it better. So, in fact, I'm going to take over, and I'm going to be God. That's what sin does. I know we don't think of it that way. It's just a little sin. It's just a little lie. Well, you're misrepresenting your creator if you lie. He is the truth, right? So, every sin is a violation of who God is in his perfect way. And it's saying, you know what? You're not really as good of a God as I would be. And so, when you put it that way, that's pretty serious stuff. And so it's no wonder that sin is an abomination to God. It ruined his creation. It broke the world. 
is sin is anti-God, whatever that sin may be, whatever sin we might want to excuse or justify, is anti-God. It's in the complete opposite direction. That's why it's hard to, to follow God and sin at the same time, because they're in opposite directions. And so God, because of his perfect nature, sin is revolting to him. He can't relate to it. And so he cannot tolerate it. I don't want to use the, uh, the image of an allergic reaction, but that's sort of what it's like. Sin with God. He has a righteous anger toward it because he understands all of it. And so while his wrath may be an uncomfortable thing for us to consider, it would actually be more uncomfortable and terrifying to think of a, of a God who didn't hate evil, I think. Because true goodness hates and stands against what is wicked. And so that's God's disposition towards sin. Yet sin is what every single human being apart from Jesus Christ is chained to and held captive by. Sin is the slave driver that leads to death. And that's where creation without Jesus Christ finds itself. That's where you and I found ourselves apart from Jesus Christ. Because of our rebellion. With no key no key to free ourselves, no, no, uh, no power, no resources, no lawyer to get us off the hook. We were held captive. We were stuck. We were like, uh, I guess it was Thursday after youth group came home and uh, we have fish, I guess is the backstory. The kids wanted some fish and so we have five uh, glow fish and Danios, I guess, I don't know, may not be pronouncing it right. Uh, you can correct me later. But they're these little tiny fish, and there are five of them. And every once in a while, they'll go swimming behind the filter. Well, I guess this day, one of them was behind the filter, because Valerie's like, there's only four fish. I'm like, that's weird. Raptured fish. I don't, I've never heard of that. No, um, the fish had to be there somewhere. And so it was behind the filter, which, you know, he, he gets behind the filter. And so you can tap it, and then he gets himself out. Well, today, or the other day, I was tapping it and tapping it and tapping it, and he's getting stressed and stressed, and he's swimming, but he couldn't get himself out. He was trapped. And so he needed somebody, he needed somebody else to come along to redeem him, to rescue him, to save him from captivity, because none of the other fish were going to do it. I, I tried. No, <laughs> Valerie ended up saving them. But he needed somebody to rescue him from that prison that he got himself into. You know, we're in the same place. We were in the same place. We were trapped in need of rescuing. We needed a savior. We needed a redeemer. Because we were like that fish with no hope of freedom. Sin was our master. And without redemption, we would be headed for eternal destruction. Rightfully so. But God in his matchless grace, despite our love for that different master, despite our rebellion, our hostility, our hatred, our hopelessness, our helplessness, steps in to be the redeemer that we needed. And he does so through Jesus Christ in verse 7, and in whom we have redemption through his blood. That's the beloved of verse 6. That's Jesus Christ. Somebody had to pay the price. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so for us to be free, we need a substitute. We need a redeemer who could buy us out of slavery and set us free from the, the punishment that our sin deserves. We need somebody who, who could step in and take the wrath that we should have faced upon himself. And that's where God's infinite, matchless grace comes into play. Because the only way that a, a holy and just God could forgive sinners like you and me is somebody still has to pay for the sin. And so we needed a perfect substitute. And only Jesus could be that substitute. Only God himself could be that substitute. So God the Son was sent. And he, though he was for, in the form of God, as Adam read this morning, did not count equality with God a, a thing to be grasped or, or held on to, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so Jesus Christ came to pay the, the price that we couldn't pay, to be the substitute that we needed to purchase our redemption. He's the only one that was qualified. He took on humanity to become like us. 
face temptations like us, yet without sin. And so because he was without sin, he's free to redeem everybody else who is in sin. And he was willing to redeem. He says in John 10, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. He's not a reluctant victim here. He's a willing savior. Willing to take on humanity to give his life for you and me. Rebels trapped in a prison of sin. When we had nobody, when we, when we had no way to pay the ransom, only Jesus could. Because he didn't have any sin of his own, right? He's holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, it tells us in Hebrews 7. God is the only one that could loose those chains. The only one that could free us from those sins. And that's why he came. That's what he tells his disciples in Mark 10, 45. He says, I came to give my life a ransom for many, to pay the price to redeem. That's why Jesus came. So that you and I could be set free. And redemption is the deliverance, the, the freedom from the punishment of sin, the freedom from the power of sin. Also, eventually lead to the freedom from the presence of sin in the future. But for this deliverance to take place, a payment, a ransom had to be made. And that ransom, it says, was the blood of Christ in whom we have redemption through his blood. And that was Jesus who was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Because all we like sheep had gone astray, we turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's why Jesus came to be crushed for our sins. So that we could be made righteous and we could be forgiven by God, which is point number two that we'll get to in just a minute. And so if you, so that redemption is, is available to anybody who would call upon the Lord. Admitting that you are a sinner, that you are stuck, that you are trapped in your sin, and that you deserve punishment for that sin. But then asking God to forgive you and asking Him to save you through Jesus Christ. Admitting that He is Lord and Savior, God will save you. Because Jesus took your place. He died instead of you. When we deserved death, when we deserved God's wrath, Jesus took it upon Himself. He didn't deserve to die. And we did, and that's why Peter says in, in 1 Peter 1, when he says in verse 18 and 19, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. God paid the highest price for you so that you could be bought out of slavery, so that he could free you from your sins, from the, the penalty, the, the power, uh, the presence, and, and the guilt, which we'll look at in a few minutes. The one who could have kept us locked away and condemned is the one who shows up to redeem us. That's how great our God is. He shed his blood for you and me. And so how does God's redemption of you change your life now? It changes your eternity if you trust Christ as your Savior, but it should change everything about you. Because now you are free from sin. That doesn't mean sin's not there because you still carry around that old man, that, that sinful flesh. But you belong to God. You're no longer a slave to sin. When you were a slave to sin, you were free from righteousness, but now the tables have turned. You belong to God and you can serve God. And so if Christ has redeemed you from sin's power and penalty, you can now live for God's purposes. And because you were bought with his blood, sin is not your master anymore. And you're no longer a slave to sin. Sometimes we think we are. It feels like we are, but we're not. Not anymore. Not with the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. We can say no to that sin now, which we couldn't say before. And so if God has purchased you with the blood of Christ, you belong to Him. You are here, you're, you're bound to Him. Free to serve Him for His glory now. And that's where Paul is going to get to later on in this book. 
And he gives us a hint of what that looks like in, in chapter 4, verse 1. He says, I therefore the, prison of the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith, you are call, wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, he says there. But he calls himself a prisoner of the Lord because literally he was. He wrote this from prison because he was faithfully following his God. didn't matter to him what happened because he was a, a bondservant, a, a slave of Christ, if you will. And so he was going to obey God no matter what, no matter where it took him. We, we looked at that verse in, in Acts earlier in our study where he says, I don't consider my, value, my, my life as any value to myself because my life is all about doing the ministry of my God. It, it's about sharing the gospel. It's about glorifying to hell. And, and Jesus stepped in and, and took me off that highway. He saved my life, and so my life is his. I owe it to him. Not that he's, you know, seeking to pay off his debts, but because of the kindness and, and graciousness that he's shown me, my life is for him now. And the same should be true for you and me. Because you are purchased by God, we are to live for His glory. You are to live for His glory. That means saying no to sin and yes to God. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 18 through 20, it says, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, he says. Speaking in the context of fleeing sexual immorality. And he says, you were bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so then he says, glorify God in everything that you do because you're not your own anymore. Nothing belongs to you in sin. It belongs to God. In Romans 6, he says similar things. He says, don't let sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. You don't have to do that anymore. Not to be used as instruments for unrighteousness. But you can present yourselves to God because you have been brought from death to life. And he says, But thanks be to God in Romans 6, 17 and 18, that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which you, have, you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. That's where this takes us. That's where redemption takes us. Sin is like an old boss. If you ever worked for a company um, and then you left that company and your old boss called you up to give you some work, are you going to do the work? And you're like, hey, yeah, sure. You don't work for that boss anymore, right? If he said, hey, guess what? Uh, I'm going to need you to, to do those quarterly TPS reports and have them to me by the end of the week. I'm guessing you're not going to do it because he has no power and authority over you, right? right? You, you work for a new company, right? This is your old boss, and he says, hey, I got some work for you to do. I'm not going to pay you for it because I'm not your boss, but I'm going to tell you to do it. You're not going to do it, and you're, not gonna, you're certainly not going to say to your new boss, uh, sorry, I can't uh, do the assignments that you've given me because I have work for my old boss to do, right? You, and you see what I'm saying there? That's sin. That's what sin does to us. Well, that's what we're saying when, 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 when we sin against God. We're saying, you know what? You know what, God? I'm not going to do the work that you have for me to do because my old boss has some work for me to do. And so let me ask you this. What sins have that effect on you? What sins, when they call you up, do you answer the phone? What sins, when they tempt you to do, do you do? What sins are still controlling you? What sins are still exerting power over you that they don't really have? What sins are you still serving that you don't need to be serving? Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's, maybe it's pride. And, and it shows up in a variety of different ways, because it will. Because, and we're always, we're, we swindle ourselves in thinking that, well, it's not really a sin because I'm doing it, right? That's kind of what sin will lie to us about. He's not really giving me an assignment. He's just asking me to do a favor, right? That's how we treat sin. Well, in Christ, you don't have to submit to those sins anymore. 
You're free to live for the God who made you. You're free to live for the God who loves you. You're free to live for the God who gave his life for you. In Christ, you're redeemed from sin's power. You're redeemed from sin's penalty so that you can live for God's purposes. In Christ, you are purchased by God. Oof, I got a decision to make here. We're at point number two. We're at almost noon here. Well, we've got to finish verse seven anyway. Number two, in Christ you are pardoned by God. Because this one goes with redemption. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. And so when Jesus purchased our redemption, he also secured our forgiveness. Like I said, these two are very closely related. Forgiveness is, is part of this redemption. But I want to look at this for a few minutes so that we dwell on this aspect of it as well. We may not get to point number three today. We'll get to it next week if we don't. I'll fill in your outline so that you can, you can get that. But uh, forgiveness is another treasure of infinite worth that we have. And what is forgiveness? Well, Mark Twain defines forgiveness this way. He says, forgiveness is the fragrance the violet gives to the heel that has crushed it. It's the smell that the flower gives off when somebody crushes it. And that makes me think of Jesus on the cross. Right? When he's being crucified by a world that hated him, what does he say? He says, Father, forgive them. That kind of fits that definition, doesn't it? The word forgiveness here means to dismiss something. Uh, remission, pardon. Uh, the word was used to, to describe a canceling of a debt, the shooting of an arrow because you're letting it go, dismissing a court case, divorcing a woman, ending a meeting, or, or loosing a ship and letting it go out to sea. So it's that idea of just, I wash my hands of it. That's what this word is. It kind of comes from the, the word, uh, the, the picture that we see on the Day of Atonement. Right? When Israel, in the Old Testament, they would have the two goats. One would be sacrificed, symbolizing the fact that sin costs a life. And then the other goat, they would keep alive and they would send it off. Right? Before they did that, the priest would, was lay, would lay his hands on that goat and, and confess on it all the, the sins of the people, sort of sim, symbolizing that, that the sins are being put on this goat, and then they'd send it away. Right? Because the, the sin was atoned for with the sacrifice, and then it was, and then it was gone. It was, it was sent away. And, and that's a picture of what we have in Jesus, right? With our redemption, with his blood, he, 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 he forgives us, the, the price has been paid, and now the sins are gone. And that's what we see here in this text. And so what forgiveness does is it frees us from the sin debt that we owe. Because Jesus shed his blood on our behalf, we are free from condemnation. And that was a condemnation that we deserved as we looked at. The power of sin is gone. The penalty for sin is gone. So is the guilt. Our sins are gone. Because Jesus took them upon himself. That's a treasure. Psalm 32 captures that idea. And David writes in that psalm, uh, he speaks of his sin with Bathsheba. He explains the guilt that he felt in, in verses 3 and 4. He says, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of, of summer. And so you get this idea uh, of the, the guilt that sin brings to a person. But he says at the beginning of the, of the psalm, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. The guilt of sin was heavy upon him. It was crushing his soul, withering his heart. But in his gracious, glorious God, ultimately in Christ, all that's gone. And he says in, in verse 5 of Psalm 32, I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me. And in that psalm, you have the, the torment of sin and the treasure of forgiveness. And, and that's what we have in Christ. We have the, the treasure of forgiveness. Blessed is the one whose sin is forgiven. We have a God who has every right to condemn us to judge us, to make us pay for our sins. But rather than condemning us, rather than judging us, rather than making us pay, Jesus paid. 
Jesus was condemned. Jesus was judged for us so that you and I could be forgiven by a gracious and merciful God. Because God cannot just overlook our sins. He cannot pretend that they didn't happen. Justice had to be served, and we saw that in the first point. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And of course, it was Jesus who willingly made the sacrifice of himself so that you and I could be forgiven. And I like the way Colossians 2, verses 12 through 14 puts it, or verses 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. That debt that you and I couldn't pay, it's been nailed to the cross. It's paid for in full. Past, present, future, the sins you're going to commit tomorrow, they're paid for. They've been nailed to the cross. They don't belong to you anymore. Jesus took them upon himself. He took them to the grave with him. And he destroyed them when he rose victoriously the third day. I can't read that passage without thinking of the words of it is well with my soul. He says, my sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. That's the response to our forgiving God. Praise the Lord. How great is our God that he would forgive my sin, not in part, but the whole. That those sins that used to define you, that used to own you, that used to, they, they were going to destroy you, they no longer belong to you. And you don't belong to them. That's the teaching that we have here. Those sins, Jesus took them from you. He was crushed for them. And he turned around and crushed them when he rose from the grave. And now you belong to him. Micah 7, 18 and 19 kind of captures this idea. And he says, who is a God like unto thee that pardons iniquity, that passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage and retains not his anger forever because he delights in mercy? He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. He will crush them. And he will cast their sins into the depths of the sea. And that's what we have in Jesus. Jesus has done that. Our sins have been crushed. They've been trampled underfoot, squashed when he took them upon himself and died for them and then rose victoriously. Our sins have been defeated. We've been forgiven so that our sins have been tossed into the sea. As far as the east is from the west, Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. This is our God who continues to forgive us. We didn't deserve it. We still don't deserve it. And he's going to continue to forgive us, to remove our sins from us. As far as the east is from the west, that's infinite. Swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist, it says in Isaiah 44, 22. Or in another image, I've cast all my sins behind your back. They're gone. I'll remember them no more. God's not going to weaponize your past. He's not going to hold them against you. You will not be condemned for them if you are in Christ. So you are rich in Jesus Christ if you are forgiven by an infinitely holy God. And so that's our identity in Christ. We are forgiven. That's a treasure that we have. And we notice in verse 7 that this forgiveness is according to the riches of his grace. This is not something that, that God hands out begrudgingly. It's not like, I guess, if I, if I have to, if it's the right thing to do. No. He chooses and delights in showing us grace and forgiveness. He's not a reluctant giver. And so his forgiveness extends as far as the riches of his grace. And so it really it flows from the bottomless well of God's incredible grace. His grace never runs out. 
And it's by his grace that you are forgiven. Now that doesn't mean, oh, well, since I'm forgiven, then I can just go on and, and live my sinful way without any guilt. Because if we understand the price that was paid for our souls and who we belong to now, we're not going to want to live in sin. Right? Paul answered that objection in Romans. He said, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Oh, you say grace. Well, can we, are we going to just go ahead and live in sin since God is a forgiving and gracious God? By no means, he says. And he says, how can we who died to sin, who've been set free from sin, still live in it? How can we who are dead to sin still live in it? So Paul says God's gracious forgiveness is not a license to sin. It's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's not an excuse to run up the bill, as it were, because somebody else is paying. We're dead to sin. We've been purchased out of it, pardoned from it. So how can we turn our back on the God who would purchase us and pardon us? and live in sin? How can we who have been given so much that we didn't deserve from the one that we offended turn around and spit in his face? How can we play around and enjoy those things that put Jesus on the cross? I think it's harder to go out and purposely hurt or sin against somebody who's been so kind and generous and gracious. And so because we have been forgiven, because we can find continual forgiveness when that old boss of sin calls you up and you pick up the phone. We have a gracious God who, when we confess that sin, will continue to forgive us. And so God's gracious forgiveness doesn't give us a license to sin. Instead, it should cause us to live for his glory. If you're in Christ, you are released from sin's guilt so that you can live for God's glory. And so how does God's forgiveness help us live for his glory? Well, I think, first of all, it should prompt us to, to praise him every day for the fact that we are no longer condemned. But we also see further application later in the book of Ephesians, in, in Ephesians 4, 31 to 32. And I think we'll have to end with this point. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, here it is, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So that's the application. And you notice the attitude that he describes there is an attitude of grace. Right? Because God is a God of grace. Because he withheld the judgment, the justice that you deserve, that I deserved, and instead treated us with kindness, graciously giving to us forgiveness. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, malice, all of those things are the opposites of grace. They're the attitudes that we cultivate in our hearts when we think that we're owed something from someone else, from God or another person, right? That's when we get angry. That's when we get bitter. This didn't turn out the way that it should have since I'm God. This is how it should have worked. And so we get the opposite of grace. But when we understand that every one of us was owed condemnation, that that's, we were owed judgment, the wages of, uh, yeah, the wages of sin is death. Right? That's what we've earned. That's the only thing that we can claim that God owes us. Right? I mean, that's, that's what the Bible teaches us. We were owed death. We were owed judgment. We were owed wrath. And yet God shows us grace. And so because of that, God says, to live for my glory, you're going to show grace. Because I'm a God of grace, and I've shown you grace. So he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Because God has shown you grace. So now you can do the same. And I think of the, the parable of the, the, the servant who was forgiven of that great debt. Right, and then he goes and he goes to collect. Oh, he's like, I want my share. That, you know, that's that's not what God saves us to do. God saves us so that we can live for His glory, and to live for His glory means that we have this attitude of grace. That we're kind, we're tender-hearted, we're forgiving, because God forgave us. When we were owed justice, God gave us grace. When we were owed wrath, God pours out blessings. 
when Jesus was being crucified. We'll go back to that before we end. What did he do? When he was being given what he didn't deserve at the hands of wicked and sinful men who really deserved to be in his place, did he give them what they deserved? As they looked on with glee, as they mocked him, as they cheered his death, what was the attitude that Jesus had? And what did he say? There was no bitterness there. There was no malice. There was no hatred. There was no sense in which he was thinking, just you wait. While being unjustly killed, he said some of the most amazing words when he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They're slaves to sin. And one writer says, those tortured words sweep away all of our shabby excuses. He says, they reveal the barrenness of our heart. They rip the cover off our unrighteous anger and show it for what it is. Many of us say, if only the people who hurt me would show some more remorse, some sorrow, then maybe I would forgive them. But since that rarely happens, we use that as an excuse to continue in our bitterness, our anger, and our desire to get even. But Jesus didn't hold the grudge. He was beaten, taunted, unjustly killed, and instead he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And that's the attitude that God calls us to have. That's the attitude that God frees us to have because he bought us out of sin. We can do that now. We can live for his glory because God says, no matter what you've done to me, I'll love you. I'll show you kindness. I'll show you mercy. I will continue to forgive you in Christ Jesus. And so we must do the same. If we're going to live for the God who richly blessed us, we must be people of forgiveness. God in his matchless grace loved us when we didn't deserve it. He chose us when we deserve to be condemned. He purchased us when we deserve to be punished. And he forgives when we deserve to be judged. Because we have been given grace upon grace, we should live for his glory. And so what we've seen in verses 3 through 7, what we're going to see when we get to verse 8, is that all of these treasures, these riches, are given to us in Christ as part of this, this downpour of grace. That's how I picture it. In the summer, it rained all the time. It felt like we were driving in downpours consistently, and you couldn't you know, see anything in front of you. Well, God downpours grace on us in Jesus Christ so that ultimately we can live for his glory. And so in Christ, you are purchased by God. In Christ, you are pardoned by God. And the next one that we'll have to get to next week is in Christ, you are privileged by God. And because we are privileged to be part of his plan for this world, we are to go out into this world as his ambassadors, representing him by following him, obeying him instead of sin, and showing grace to the world around us. Let's pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the downpour of grace that you have rained on us in Jesus Christ. When we should have received the downpour of your wrath, you poured that wrath down on Christ as our substitute to buy us, us, rebels, enemies, who wanted nothing to do with you. And you purchased us out of that out of eventual destruction, you purchased us for yourself by your grace. You forgave us when we should have been condemned. Lord, we thank you for your great grace. Now, Father, help us to respond to that grace the right way. Help us to follow you to glorify you in the way that we live our lives and help us to show grace, show that same type of grace to others as your ambassadors. Give us the, the enabling power to live the way that you've called us to live so that we might, in response to your grace, live for your glory. And Father, as we leave here today, as we go our separate ways, as we travel to our homes, as we uh, gather around our, our meals, as we interact with one another and, and perhaps others this afternoon, help us to be mindful. Give us the, the strength to, to, to make Jesus Christ visible to those in our lives. 
And Father, we pray that you'd dismiss us with your blessing and bring us safely back this evening as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.